So today we're going to look at one of the absolute most important models in football, the expected goals model. So if you haven't heard of expected goals, then probably this video isn't for you. You should check out one of our other training ground videos where we explain how to use expected goals and the concept behind it. The idea in this lecture is we're really gonna get stuck into the details. What exactly is an expected goals model? What is the data behind an expected goals model? And how do we fit that expected goals model to data? And this is quite an important step because it's the first time we're going to look at a, a statistical model which tries to predict the outcome of events in football. And that will really lay the ground for later work where we use different types of what are now called machine learning models in order to understand the game. Now, I just want to say before I start, if, if um, I've got my dog Tobias here, or our dog Tobias, and he was a bit scared. There was a thunderstorm just now, so he came and sat up with me while I'm giving this lecture. So just in case an ear pops up or something like that, I'm just telling you about that beforehand. But we'll let Tobias rest down there just now. Okay, so let's have a look at expected goal. So as I said, this is the first step and I think there'll be three steps of how to build an expected goals model. Not just how to build it, but also the, the implications. What can we do later with the same sorts of methods? And also, what are the limitations of expected goals models? So what can we, can we and we can't do? What can we do and what we can't do with an expected goals model? So this is the first step. And today I'm going to talk about the data that goes into an expected goals model. We're going to use some data available for Scout from a whole season of various leagues of football. And also I'm going to talk about the model because every time you have some data and you want to understand something about that data, you also need to have a model which helps you explain what you find interesting about that data or what generally is interesting about that data. So the part one is the data and the model. I'll start with just a little recap. What are expected goals? Okay, so expected goals are a statistical measure of chance quality. They're basically the probability that on a typical day of football, a particular shot from that location will result in a goal. And how do we know that? Well, what we do is we take measurements over many, many um, different matches, different shots, possibly in the same or in different or similar leagues. And we take all of those measurements and we put them into a statistical model and we see what is the probability on a typical day of football that a shot from that location, um, a shot or a header, um, played in from a cross or a corner, all of these different characteristics, what is the probability that a typical shot of that type ends up being a goal? Okay, so why are expected goals important? Well, there's various reasons for this, and I thought I'd go through a few of them. And I think the first reason is that they often tell a story about a match or a recent number of matches that you can't just see from the scoreline. So here is um, a lovely expected goals map uh, produced by Michael Cayley, who puts these things up on Twitter. And he's made an expected goals map for Liverpool and Atletico. And what, what Michael does, which is really nice, whenever he writes these tweets out, he sort of tells that little story. And, and that's the thing. He says, sometimes in football, one keeper has a great game, one team takes a few great shots, and the better team doesn't win. And that may be, well, I'm a Liverpool fan, but this, this sort of summed up this, uh, this game between Liverpool and Atletico Madrid. Over the 120 minutes of football that was played, the score was 2-3, Atletico, the away team won. But you can see here from the map that... Liverpool had by far the most shots. And they also had quite a few shots of very high quality nearer the goal. And this, the, the area of this square is proportional to the expected goals, the probability that on a typical day of football, a team would score from there. Okay, and another thing that Cayley did, he was one of the first people to point out this really important um, result about expected goals. They predict future goals better than goals themselves. And this is why bookmakers love expected goals. So any bookmaker worth their salt will be using an expected goals model to set the odds for future matches. That's because of the following result, that if you look at the expected goals a team has now, that's actually shown on the x-axis, and you look at its future ratio of expected goals, 
this, the R squared here, which is a bit small for you to see, but the R squared here is 0.5892. And that's better than the R squared for goals plotted against future goals. So if you can find the expected goals ratio of a team over the last few matches, that better predicts how many goals they're going to score in the future. And Michael Kelly is actually six years now ago, ago, I was amazed to see. He was one of the first people to really report this in, in a thorough way. And it's been shown for different leagues in different ways that expected goals better predicts the future than goals themselves. And the reason for this is quite simple. Goals are quite unusual in football. You only expect to score one or two goals in a match. So they're not a very good predictor of future goals compared to expected goals, where you get lots of observations of the quality of the chances that a team has scored. I'm going to come to this a little bit later, um, but in the medium term, they give a more accurate measure of form than goals. I'll, I'll come back to that, that point later because it requires a little bit more understanding of, of how the expected goals model work before we do that. But I think that's something that we're, you should bear in mind. And also, uh, what are the reasons we're interested in expected goals? Well, they can be used to help um, guide players and coaches in decision making. So this is a figure I used in my earlier video about how to explain expected goals to a player. And you can use it in a very simple way that you just say, well, there's different probabilities of scoring from different places. If you're inside this ring, you have a 30% chance of scoring. Inside this ring, you have a 15% chance. And inside this ring, you have a 7% chance. And then outside of that ring, you have a lower than 7% chance. So that gives an idea about where, where you should get the ball from to shoot. And it gives some sort of, it gives a few counterintuitive things here as well. Because if you look at these points out here, which you might think are quite good shooting angles, they're not as reliable places to score goals from. Uh, um, as, for example, a point out here. So you can actually find out a bit about the geometry of where you should shoot from. And I think this is probably one of the most important part of the, of the Friends of Tracking project here, is that the expected goals are the first step in approach to modeling football data that is grounded in models, or the, or the first step to looking at football data an approach that's grounded in models. If you've watched one of my other talks, you'll see about my, if you've looked at my future, seeing into the future seminar, you'll have seen that I like to think of splitting football into three different concepts, into pass probability, uh, pass impact, and pitch control. And many of the lectures we've looked at so far have concentrated on pitch control, who will come first to the ball in various different situations. And less of it, and, and, what we, and what we're going to do now is we're going to concentrate more on the impact of different actions. And we're going to look later, later in the course, um, Lotta and Jan from SciSports are going to tell us about pass impact models or action impact models, expected possession value models. And they are basically going to build on the ideas from expected goals that we're going to look at, at today. Okay, so, I'm going to try and relate model to data, but what is the data that's behind the idea of expected goals? So the data we're going to use here is data from Y Scout, and they have sees they have that they have data from five seasons of top flight football. I think it's England, Spain, Germany, France, and Italy. And if you haven't already done this, I think I went through this in the in one of the first lectures about where you could download this data, but it has been a while ago for you who are following the course. Um, you can download this as a, this, uh, I'll put it at the bottom of the YouTube thing as well, but you can download the data set that we're going to use here. And it's event data from those matches. And there's going to be a lot of goals in there, a lot of shots, which will allow us to fit an expected goals model to that. And I'll start by loading in all of these events. Now it takes a little while for all of this data to uh, load in because it's event data for an entire season. But once we've loaded it in, and basically the next few steps is just setting up the, uh, the data I'd like to go. So I'm not gonna go into detail in this. It's setting up what I call the shots model. And the shots model provides um, it, it just provide, it just basically picks out all of the shots that aren't headers, that aren't free kicks, and aren't penalties, and it puts them into one data frame, which we can then use to, to fit our expected goals model. 
separately, and maybe I'll make this as a sort of um, an exercise, is you could maybe make an expected goals model for headers later. But just now, we're just interested in shots that happen during open play. Okay, so it's worth just concentrating a little bit on this command here. This is um, makes a, a two-dimensional histogram of where shots occurred. I love these two-dimensional histograms because they, well, they're particularly good in football because you can see where events happen on the pitch. And this is a, this is a numpy command which makes a 2D histogram. And it tells us both, this histogram both looks at where shots occur from, that's the H shot, and then second of all, where the goals occur from. So once I've got these, uh, these goals and these shots into histogram, I can plot them, and that's what the following code does. And we'll, we'll start by plotting where all the shots occur in football. So this, um, this shows exactly that. I think I'll just make all these plots, then I'll, then I'll go back over to PowerPoint and actually show you, the, show you them a bit clearly. But just so you know, here's the code, that's the code that makes all the shots. So the plots that this code makes look, well, they look exactly like this uh, for, the, for the English data. And this shows us the number of shots, a heat map of the number of shots that are taken from different places of the pitch. And you'll see that this scale goes from zero to 50. So this is throughout an entire season of 380 matches. How often did shots occur from these different locations? And you see lots of shots here occur from around about this area, level with the, the penalty area. There's also a fair number of shots that occur from longer outside the box. Now, one odd thing you'll notice when you work with this data, and this is true for a few data providers, there's a weird phenomenon where there's no shots on the edge of, or there's a very few shots on the edge of the box. This, I think, is mainly due to a coding error where the, where the, the people who are watching the match and, and encoding the event data, they tend to either put the shot within the box or outside the box, and very seldom on this line around the box. I've never quite got to the bottom of that. If anybody knows exactly why it's like this, they can tell me, but that's, I think, a limitation of the data. So here we have, in any case, the shot locations. Actually, there's various, various other limitations of the data as well. And one of them is, for example, pitches of different sizes and the coordinates don't match exactly what we've done here. If you're really going to get into making the most detailed expected goals model, you also need to account for the, for the size of the pitch and so on. But let's, let's not get too worried or concerned about those, those difficulties just now. And let's concentrate on the overall pattern here. Now we can see where most of the shots occur from football. Unsurprisingly, there's very few shots from out here, and there's also very few shots from further distance. Most of the shots occur reasonably close to the goal. And there's, there's actually quite few shots right next to the goal as well, because you, you hardly ever get into those, those shooting positions. And then, now let's look at where the goals scored. Now this gives a very different picture. The goals are scored, and also you can see the scale has changed here. This is now going from 0 up to 12 instead of 0 up to 50. The goals are more often scored from nearer to the goal. And even though there were fewer shots here, right in the six-yard box, there are quite um, a lot of goals scored from uh, in the six-yard box. And lots of goals scored here um, inside the box. And much fewer goals, unsurprisingly, are scored from distance further out here. Now, um, what we're interested in is not the number of shots or the number of goals. We're interested in the probability of scoring from different places. That's what the expected goals model is going to build on. And that can be got, gotten by dividing through the number of goals scored by the number of shots made at these different places. And so we actually do a point-to-point -point division here. So every point on the number of goals is divided by the corresponding point on the number of shots to give the following plot of the proportion of shots resulting in a goal. So goals divided by shots basically means the frequency of scoring from different places. And when we look in more detail at the proportion of shots resulting in the goal, we actually start to see the pattern emerging. So very close to the goal mouth, 
there's pretty much a, there's a great, well, there's a 50% chance of scoring these types of shots. The so scale from this is zero to 50. Further out, you have a 20 to 30% chance of scoring. Once you get out here into the further away areas of the box, this drops to a sort of 10% chance of scoring on the color scale. And then further out, this is where you have your um, three to 5% chances of scoring. And once you get to, out here, there's something like a 1% chance of scoring a, a shot from here. Now you'll see this figure is very pixelated and I kind of wanted to make it so you can you can sort of see the fine scale of this data. So, so what this illustrates is, for, so for a certain, for example, this shot here, somebody shot from here and scored. Now, why this comes out as quite a good chance of scoring, despite the fact we know it's not a good chance of scoring, is that very few shots occur from exactly that point. But it did happen that the one shot that occurred from that, or maybe one out of two shots that occurred from that, ended up being scored and being a goal. And that, of course, can happen. I mean, again, these things happen in football. There's a lot of randomness in football. Occasionally, you do score from out here or out here or out here. Um, and, but more often, you score from in here. But what we really want to do, and that's what we're going to do with the expected goals model, is somehow smooth out this. So we don't want to base a model on the idea that you can always score from exactly that point, because that was just one random event that meant that um, the, the player who, who shot from there scored. And this point is something I want to emphasize in particular. It's very important whenever we're trying to understand data in this way, that we have a model which gives an underlying explanation of the data. As I said, one thing we want to do, of course, is smooth out the data in some way so it, it looks smoother and more reasonable. But it's more important that we actually want to create a model which allows us to understand why you're going to score goals from certain places and you're not going to score goals from other places. And the model I build is based on the idea that the more of the goal that you can see and the closer you are to the goal, the greater the probability you're going to score. So it's not rocket science, but it's taking in basic football principles and using that to build up a model to understand why we score goals from certain points and why we don't score goals from other points. So let's formulate a model based on this goal angle. Now, this angle I have, I've written here, I've called it theta. It is the angle from the point at which you're shooting that, um, so you take the point at which you're shooting from, you take a line directly to the two posts of the goal, and then you calculate the angle of the triangle that results from that. And that's basically the goal angle, how much of the goal you can see. And when you're a long way away like this, theta, this angle is very small, but when you're closer, this angle is very big. And actually what's quite nice about this angle, I think, is that it takes account of, it can take account of when you're wider out as well as when you're further away. So these two angles are the same. In one of them, you're a long way away. One of them, um, you're nearer by, but you've got a sort of you, you can't see the face of the goal um, as clearly because you're, you're further out. And so I, 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 like this, I like this angle a lot because it really is something you can say to players um, and talk about with players. I do this with my under-15s team. It's talking about how much of the goal you can see when you shoot. The more of the goal you can see, the better your chance of scoring. And that's exactly what this angle is. There's a bit of trigonometry involved. I've put it up here that if you want to go through it uh, later, and there's a very nice paper actually by Cesar Morales, an engineer, where he actually suggests that based on these calculations, you should redesign the penalty area. He's campaigning for a change of the penalty area to account for shooting angle. The basic idea is that the penalty area should be defined by this, this angle of, of how well you can see the goal. But anyway, the point here is you can do a little bit of trigonometry and you can work out based on the XY coordinates of the shot, what is this angle? And so you get a, a, a function here, which is tan theta for the angle is a function of the x, y coordinates of the shot. The 7.32 that comes into this equation, that is the, um, that's the width of the goal. And so you can use this to calculate your angle from the x, y coordinates. And, and I do this in the Python, the Python code. We'll go back and have a look at that later. And what you find is that this angle predicts the probability of scoring. So what I've plotted here 
is for exactly the same data as I looked at before for the English Premier League. I've looked at the shot angle in degrees, and I've looked at the probability, the proportion of those shots that were scored. And you'll see here that when the shot angle is very low, when you can only see a small amount of the face of the goal, there's a few exceptions right at the start, but pretty much from, from around about here, you have a very ch low chance of scoring, and that chance increases as the angle increases. So when you can see about 90% of the when you've got a 90 degree angle to the face of the goal, then you must be right in front of it. You've got a very high probability of scoring. There are other important factors, and the angle, of course, is it is correlated with the distance to the goal. So the nearer you are to the goal, the better your chance of scoring. And so we can also look at, for example, the distance from the goal. And this is, the, this is a plot of the distance, how the distance from the goal predicts the probability of scoring. When you're zero meters from the goal, probability of scoring is one and as you go further and further away from by the time that you're 10 meters from the goal this is dropped to about 20 percent and then when you're 30 meters from the goal it's dropped down to almost zero percent there is interesting again we see the the effect that small numbers of observations will come up with various things so it turns out that at exactly um, well not exactly but around 57 meters away from the goal there is a 50% uh, a chance of scoring. And that's again, because very, very few shots are taken from those distances. And so there will be one occasion in that Premier League season where somebody has taken the ball and managed to score from the halfway line in this case. And so it, it does happen in football, of course, but it just doesn't happen very often. And just going back to recap here, what I've tried to do in these, these two plots is basically reduce the problem where we have lots and lots and lots of different points around here. Tobias is, is waking up now, so it must be nearly time for me to, to finish this video. Um, we have lots and lots of points around here, and we what we want to do is we want to simplify them with a simplifying model. And that's done with um, here. So we've simplified it now down to a sort of one-dimensional picture where it's just the angle that's important. And we said, well, okay, maybe there's another dimension that's important and that's distance, and that's the plot of the probability of scoring. And so next time, I'm going to take the, this angle and this distance, and I'm going to fit a statistical model to them, which will allow us to predict whether a particular shot is a goal or not. And that model, that statistical fitting, will be our expected goals model. Okay, tune in next time for that.